morning again. I'm happy to see you here at the panel Not Worthy of Trust. Why can it be a good idea to give criminals a second chance? My name is Jakob Racek. I'm head of the information department at the Goethe Institute. And I think I can promise you that this panel will be one of the highlights uh, of the Kultur Symposium today as I have two wonderful guests here that I would like to introduce to you. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome here with us Abby Abinanti. Abby, you came all the way from North California, uh, and I'm very happy that you can be here with us today. You are the chief judge of the Yurok, an indigenous tribe from California. And you also hold a doctorate in law from the University of New Mexico. And as the first Native uh, American woman, you passed the Californian bar exam, and you were also appointed to the state bench, um, also as the first Native American woman. Um, for over 17 years, you were a state uh, officer for the San Francisco Superior Court, um, assigned to the United Family Court. And since 1979, you have been a Yurok Tribal Court judge um, and a chief tribal court judge, a position you held in connection with your superior court uh, assignment until 2015. I'm very happy that you can be here with us today. Second guest at our panel today is uh, Arne Nielsen. You came not such a long way, but still from Oslo, Oslo Fjord, from Norway. You spent 15 years in pastoral and social work in Norway and the UK, including developing and managing institutions before you joined the Norwegian Correctional Services. Also, you served as a chief probation officer and a senior advisor and assistant deputy general in the Norwegian Ministry of Police and Justice. And later, you became governor of the Bastoy Island Prison, a place we will learn much more about today. But also as a trainer and lecturer, you were also involved in several uh, international projects, amongst others in the development of a human ecological prison unit in Romania. You have been also working in Georgia, in Russia, and 24 years ago, you opened your own practice as a Gestalt psychotherapist, which you still run today. Arne, welcome to Weimar. Happy to have you here. Um, let me start with a short personal note or memory. Uh, I was 15 years ago uh, a student here in Weimar at the Bauhaus University, studying philosophy, uh, and our quite left-leaning teachers uh, were big followers, big fans of French postmodern and post-structuralist uh, theory and philosophy. And of course, we had to read Michel Foucault uh, every day, uh, like every day and every night. And uh, one of his seminal works, uh, which has some importance to the topic we discussed today, is uh, Discipline and Punish, where Michel Foucault locates the prison or the birth of the prison to an almost uh, specific date uh, in the year 1800. 1800 is also a very important date when we talk about Weimar, because it's the time of enlightenment, it's the time of Goethe, later Schiller. Um, but it's also the time, as Foucault say, says, the time when we can kind of locate the origin or the birth of the modern prison system, the modern correctional uh, institution system and the modern justice system. Um, for Foucault, the prison is much more than just an institution. It's rather like an, uh, a, a paradigm for our modern society that is based a lot on control and discipline. Um, and thus, he thinks institutions as a prison, uh, also together with other institutions, schools, hospitals, universities. Now, 200 years later, while we are sitting here, there seems to be a kind of shift in these paradigms uh, from a society that is based on discipline and control to 
kind of new forms that we can also track in the justice system. Um, so instead of punishment through exclusion, prison system, the focus today is more on integration, rehabilitation and responsibility. And with you, Abby, and you, Arne, we have two representatives of this reformative or restorative approach in justice here today. One of these topos, one of these examples definitely is the island of Bastoy, that we will hear, hear more about in a few minutes. And the other one is the Yurok Tribal Court, which is based less on conventional, conventional legal norms than on uh, uh, other values and traditions of the Yurok people in California. What we would like to do today is to discuss such models and the potential of such alternative models for our existing justice system. And we would like to discuss this with our guests, of course, but also with you. So we will open up the discussion at the end, and we will be very happy if you um, involve yourself with your questions. But first, I would like to start with uh, a question to Abby. Abby, when you joined the Euro Tribal Court in 2007, it still operated as a um, normal state court. What you and your colleagues did was to transform it into something quite different. Could you briefly describe this transformation or also this difference between the state justice system and the tribal system that you um, formed? Well, we were, we were fortunate in one way because when I went home, we were just organizing and they had the expectation that we would create a court and it had been created. But I wanted to be really clear in my coming home and having spent as much time as I had on the state bench that this was not our form of justice. Mm -hmm. We were only about a hundred and, well right now we're 175 years away from the invasion and before that we had lived on our river for thousands of years. So we had a place and we had an approach. And most of what the rest of the world is doing at this point is forming rights-based cultures. And that creates a different value system than our value system. And our value system was one of responsibility. Responsibility to and responsibility for. And so therefore you're naturally going to have different practices because it's a totally different approach. And so when I look at not worthy of our trust, <clears throat> I can look at that and go, okay, we may not trust them, but I can guarantee you they do not trust you either. And the reason they don't is if you look at, in the States, disproportionality, and you look at prison systems, and you realize they're full of people of color, disproportionately, and that they're used as labor and not paid for that. So you go, okay, well, why would I trust you? I know how I got here. Part of it is you have to look at them and go, okay, that's partially true. But what is also partially true when you say, why is it a good idea to give criminals a second chance? I don't call them criminals, I call them relatives. We would never call anybody a criminal because humans by nature do wrong and you have to be able to get help when you do wrong and you have to be able to give help and to help people get back to their responsibilities because we do not believe that humans are disposable. We believe that they must come back and they must interact in community and that's way different than the systems that have been set up in our land. So when we approach it, we approach it from that sense and in California and in the northern part of the state, after the invasion, we had three major problems. One of them was the massacres. There were more massacres in California than in any other state. The second one was indentured slaves. The state came in as a non-slave state. Well, they enslaved natives and they primarily enslaved native children. And the only way, as all of you who are parents in the audience will know, that you're going to take somebody's children from them is you kill the parents. 
So you kill the parents in front of them. And one of the sort of jokes in, in tribal communities is when the person would take the children in and say to the judge, I want them to be a slave or be an indentured servant. And the judge would say, well, you know, you can only do that if they're orphans. And the person who brought the children in would say, I know they're orphans because I killed their parents. And that's the joke. You know, so that was the second problem. And the third problem was forced boarding schools where you would take them and you would put them in boarding schools, mistreat them, take their language, take their culture. And you go, well, that was a long time ago. Well, I'm old, but I'm not that old. And my mother and her sisters were in boarding schools. And from those behaviors come today's behaviors of what people call criminals and what I call relatives because many of those situations leave trickle-down behaviors. Because humans enable, if they want to change, they have to know why. Why did this happen? Why did I do this? And oftentimes you can look at them and they don't know why because they haven't been told that. So some of the first steps we take with them is for them to ask the elders in their family which of those things happened. Because the behavior they're exhibiting now came from one of those things, because we did not have that behavior before. And I think that makes you know, a huge difference in how you approach the problem and let them take responsibility for it. And the other part of our approach is small caseloads. And what you get is people who help you. And what the court is and identifies as, as a member of your extended family. And when you need help in these areas, you come to us. Sometimes we catch you in jail, but sometimes you can just walk in off the street and say, I need help. I'm doing this. I need to go to treatment. Help me, and we will help you. You don't have to be caught to get help. Thank you very much, Abby. So tr redis redistribution of trust and responsi responsibility as a way of rehabilitation this is more or less the way how uh, the tribal court works. Can you give us some more practical examples how you integrate the values and the practices of your community into the justice system? Well, when we start, when we do our intake interviews, we do the intake to see what trauma their family was involved in and what they gapped on. If you go to boarding school or if you're a slave, you're not parented. So then, how do you grow up and parent? That's a very hard problem, because you have a huge gap. So then you have to go, how are we going to teach them to parent in our fashion? So then we have classes for parenting. So it's really building up their skills, and not just saying to them, don't be a bad parent. It's like saying, you know, fly. Okay, but how? You know, and that, that's the thing. So you look at what their skill set is, and then you help them learn the skill and you help them reintegrate into the community because we believe as a people you come in with a purpose and if you don't fulfill your purpose, that means it's forever undone. No one can step in. So you have to do that. You have to, if you are to be a parent, you have to learn the skill. So that's a huge responsibility being a parent. And so what you're trying to do is teach them all the gaps that they didn't have or if they haven't had education. Like we have the highest dropout rate from elementary school of any race. That's not workable anymore. You have to learn these skills. So we will help you do that. We will help you get jobs. Anything that you think you need to do to reintegrate into your family and into the culture because the culture is divided not just into your regular families, which are very large, but into cultural families, what we call dance families and ceremony families. And if you have not been connected with them because they were repressed until about 50 years ago, more or less, and then they started coming back, then we will get you back into your dance family so you can have your cultural responsibilities, which are serious and take up a lot of time and energy. Um, you already mentioned that uh, um, Europe uh, are heavily disadvantaged by the 
state justice system, by the American state justice system. How is this connected or what role plays the, how you, you said, um, invasion or colonization or I would also say the resulting collective traumatization of the Euroc people? How, which role does it play? Well, I think that when you've been through, when you live like we did in peace for so long in a, in a place that we were given, in a beautiful place, and they come and they take that from you and they kill a huge number of you, that leaves a serious lagging. And what we did to escape that was run and hide. And we hid because the geography allowed us to. And we still, in the eastern part of our reservation, don't have electricity, for instance. The roads up there sometimes work and sometimes don't. Um, cell phone coverage, we're, going, we're hoping to get that soon, but we don't have it everywhere. So it's, it's very different and you have to figure out what you're going to do to, to survive. And we did that, but in doing that we became invisible. So that if you look at the textbooks, we, they don't talk about the genocide in our state. They don't talk about the fact that we have the largest number of native people of any state. They don't talk about the forced relocation of other tribes to our state. They don't talk about the fact that we have 110 recognized tribes and 70 tribes trying to queue up to be recognized. So that puts a lot of pressure on us to go, how are we going to do the next part? And what we've decided is essentially, we're going to come back out into place because we know how to be in this place. We managed it for thousands of years. Then these others came and in less than 200 years, they're close to wrecking the joint. That's quite an achievement, but it's not one that is going to serve anyone. And if they wreck the joint, our survival technique of running and hiding will not, will not serve again because they are so reckless. So we must teach them how to be in place. And we realize that, that we have to come out. And so we're working with partnering with the justice systems. Like we divert a number of our criminals from their jails back to us so that we can manage them and work with them for a couple of years to teach them the skills to be back in community and to meet their responsibilities as parents and as family members and dance family members and as members of, you know, you, for us, Arnie and I were just talking about, in our language, in many native languages, the word for people is you have human people, bear people, dog people, tree people, river people, you're all the same. We are, we are not the top of the scale, which ought to be fairly obvious by how we behave, but it's not something a lot of people understand. So if uh, a member of your community comes in touch with the law, she or he can kind of deliberately decide whether to um, deal with the state court or the Euro court. Did I uh, get this right? Well, oftentimes what happens is they get in trouble in the state court and then we go to the state court with our workers and say, can we talk to them? We talk to them and then we say, why don't you give them to us for a year or two? And if they do well, can we reconsider what you might sentence them to be? Mm -hmm doing, you know, or people will get, feel like they have issues and want to come in and say, um, can you help me because I need this now? Will you, will you help us with this? And we will let them come in. Because they don't have to be caught to get help. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's very odd as a concept. So basically, the tribal court settles legal disputes between Europe people, is it also possible to extend this to conflicts between the majority and the Europe people? Well, there's a couple of th ways we do that. One is because of our approach, we're being very successful, so we share that approach with the state courts and allow them to adapt it. We also have a joint court in two counties where I sit with the state court judge in foster care situations and work with our clients. Euroc clients 
and it's been so successful, how we do it as opposed to how they do it, that they've created a non Yurok family wellness court. Mm -hmm. And others go to that court. We have a child support court. We're the only state or the only tribe in the state that has a child support court because we can disallow them to engage with our parents. But I said, you know, we're not, we're not a people who ignore our children, so we're going to have one, but I will change it so it looks like who we are, which is we will have a different standard because we're poorer, and I will allow for in-kind, where the families can support. If the parties agree, the families can contribute. For instance, if two parties break up, and one party's parents say, well, I'll babysit so you can both work, that's child support. You know, and so those kinds of things are allowed. Or if I'll give deer meat during the winter, or fish, or bring wood because a lot of us still wood heat. You know, so there's all sorts of things you can do. We also have the only state certified program for batter intervention for domestic violence because we ended up with that as a problem as part of the invasion. We didn't have it before, and now we do. So it's our responsibility to face that and to deal with it. And so we have a program, and we've allowed non-natives into the program, but we require them to also make cultural exploration of their culture, to see where they learned that kind of behavior. And it's been very useful and successful for them, both for the natives and for the non-natives. Mm -hmm. uh, Abby, you joined the state justice system in the early 90s, and you made a real march through all these institutions. Can you tell us a little bit more about your personal motivation? Why you decided to do so? Well, I don't know how much you know about old ladies, but I was graduating from college after I was sort of forced to go to college. And three older Native women said, oh, let's go have coffee. And if anybody ever does that to you, be very, very careful. So we went to have coffee and they said, about midway through, wouldn't you like to go to law school? To which I said, no, why would I want to go to law school? And they said, they continued in that line. And then finally, they said, well, you're going to law school because there's a scholarship and you're the only one graduating. And I'm like, no, I'm not, but you can't win those arguments. <laughs> so off I went to law school. So that, I, I don't know much about personal motivation, fear, I guess. <laughs> So I went to law school um, and I came home. I did, as part of the being forced, require that one of them who had a son in college make him go to law school also, for which he never forgave me, but <laughs> so be it. Uh, you know, so a lot of it was that. And then coming home, I just had different opportunities and did different kinds of work and worked in the community And I have to say that the judicial system was not prepared to have somebody like me be in their courtrooms. And I think the first thing a judge ever said to me was, you can't be a lawyer, you're an Indian. To which I answered, you're half right, Your Honor. You know, and so that's pretty much how my career as a lawyer went. Um, you know, my obligation was to fight and to stand next to my people wasn't necessarily to win, but to do the right thing. How is the situation now? Is there well, young there, lawyers? Is there young there, courts? There are more young lawyers, and I've uh, browbeat a number of people, and as I get older, I, I've learned the skill of browbeating. So I, our court administrator, for instance, I had her do online law school, why being the court administrator, and she did pass the bar. And so I have now a second one that I'm browbeating, and you know, you go on and on. And when I go home, I will uh, go to a swearing-in of the first Native American federal bench officer, who is one of the relocated natives uh, who were forced to come to California. You know, and we're all very proud of her. Um, and the president of her nation is coming out for the swearing-in because it's a very big deal for us. Um, You know, so you have to do that. You have to look around and go, okay, we have to change and we have to integrate a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, Abby. We will change now location and go from the Californian West Coast to the Oslo Fjord in Norway. As you probably know, Norway is quite famous for its liberal prison system and liber liberal legal system. But even to those standards, uh, Arne, the prison that you managed for several years, Bastoy prison, is quite exceptional. Um, I would ask you to shortly introduce, you to, uh, introduce us to Bastoy Island, the prison, the institution, the way you work there uh, with, worked there with inmates. And while you do so, we will also show some pictures so that you can get a better image uh, of Bastoy Prison Island. Thank you. <coughs> It's really, I need, need to rethink a bit because I'm so listening to Abby. Um, it touching me in so many ways uh, to meeting her and the values and the story she's sharing with me. Um, uh, Basta, um, actually, first I have to say that I'm, I'm a clinical psychotherapist. And uh, with being that, you might think that I'm treating people. I don't think that a psychotherapist should treat people. It's, it's not possible. I'm a psychotherapist being for inmates or for neighbors at back home, uh, is to be there for them, to see them, to support them, to discover themselves. Uh, this subject is about, uh, the subject here during these days is trust. For, for me, it was obvious when I was taking on that job as a prison governor to do all what I can, what I could, to support the inmates to start to trust themselves. Because they do lack that. Baste is an island in the Oslo Fjord. It's a beautiful place, as you can see. I, I never dreamt, I had never any desire of becoming a prison governor after so many years in the Ministry of Justice and abroad doing certain things uh, in the correctional services. But uh, I had been on that island uh, earlier as a therapist. Um, to, so I knew the place. I knew that the prison government governor at that time was changing the farming to an ecological way of farming. It tried to approach the way we could make a place for inmates to uh, learn to take responsibility for themselves, to give them a freedom uh, which made it possible for them to develop uh, a responsibility for their life. You know, prison, uh, the only the only way you, the, the only similar thing, institutions you can find to, 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 to which, which would be like a prison, it's a kindergarten. Do you know that? Because sending your small child to a kindergarten, you know that the people there would take care of her, your daughter or your son, all the day. Sending a person to prison, he doesn't need to do anything. That's a traditional way of putting people in prison. The responsibility belonged to the governor and his staff and his officers. But on that island, we tried to change that when I came to the island. And I said, <clears throat> this should be a place where we uh, uh, implant some certain missing links in the way we talk about prison, because the one is responsibility. The other thing is trust. And the third thing, uh, is how do we teach respect? Respect. So I started with uh, training the staff to tell them that I would not make any difference between the staff and the inmates because we are all humans. And uh, I expect you as a staff, as a prison officer, to treat any inmates on this uh, land as you treat your fellow um, colleagues. When the inmates came to that place, uh, uh, Basta is a uh, medium security prison. And uh, my goal was to change 
the security system from uh, static security to the dynamic security. There's no fence there, not one camera on the island. 125, 30 inmates, what they have in common is that they have committed serious crime. They have many years to face in prison. And when they came there, I said to my staff members, I would like to see the inmate in my office when he come. Or not, I see him at lunchtime, because we had lunch together with the inmates. We started to do that. And I started to talk with the inmate and invited him to, to be open about his, uh, his dreams or his thoughts about coming to this island. And I said, there are a couple of subjects I will talk to you about. The first one is respect. And I saw that he was expecting me to talk about my expectations for him to respect me as uh, the governor and the system in the prison. And I said, no, no, you, I, I don't spend time on that. I'm going to talk about you, to you, uh, about how you respect yourself. And very often they said, I have no respect for myself. I'm just a, excuse me my language, but they said, I'm just a piece of shit. I, 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 I'm a criminal. And I said, I don't know any criminals. Well, what, is, what is being a criminal? You're a human. And I tried to say to him that from now on, I will treat you with my respect to you as a human, because in my eyes, you, have the same, you are the same worth as I am. And I expect my officers to treat you as a human, not as a criminal. And in that way, I hope you will discover self-respect. Because how can we expect any inmates, for instance, to respect anything if they don't know what respect is? Some of them knew what self-respect was, uh, but they had lost it because of life. Some of them, some of them had never experienced the they didn't know anything about a good self-esteem or self-respect. So that was the first rule. The other one was responsibility. I created a prison arena there as a kind of a, a place to develop respect and responsibility. And in that place, no one will come and wake you up in the morning take you to the school or to the workshop. You have to wake up, uh, get to the place you are supposed to be. And in that way, as you do that, I will give you more and more responsibility uh, on this island. Uh, and uh, in that way, we discovered that people who had been transferred from an ordinary of, uh, prison in Norway, who had been involved in some riots and done uh, some bad things in the prison. After a few weeks on this island, they changed their way of behaving. Because of, not because of a rise of more static security, but because of respect, handing over responsibility for their own lives, making them to discover what it is like to live in such a community. Uh, you know that the reoffending rate in Europe from prison is about 75%. After two years, they will be back in prison. I asked uh, one of the researchers <coughs> to find out uh, the reoffending rate from my prison. It was 16. But still, uh, in Norway, in Europe, we continue to more of what we know doesn't work because I don't believe in the punishment in itself. I have discovered that uh, as a human being, I have a, um, I have a need of revenge if someone is harming me. But to, to, to use punishment in the way we do in traditional prisons is making these people to represent a worse threat to the society the day they are back in, in, in the community than they were, was before <clears throat> they were uh, arrested. So I call the place, uh, my prison, as a place of healing. Had, and, and an American journalist uh, came to see me because I had people coming from all, all the world, from Japan and from uh, US and 
and Europe. And he said to me, Arne, are you running a holiday camp for criminals? And he said, you, you are nearly giving me a heart attack because he couldn't believe what he saw because uh, he couldn't even see the difference between officers and, and the staff and, 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 and the inmates. And I said to him, so what? And he said, so what? And I said, well, look at the reopening rate. Are your personal need first, first to punish people or do you want this person to become a less threat to your community after having been in your prison, in, in, in prison? And I told him about the reoffending rate and after a day walking around and he changed his mind. And he said, this is interesting. Something that I learned from both of you now is that the deprivation of liberty is probably not the worst thing about our penal system, but it's the deprivation of responsibility uh, and, uh, and respect. Um, and your approaches, approaches also show uh, in very nice and uh, practical way how this system can be changed. Still, I would ask you, Arne, if uh, in your practice in, in Bastoy, um, if you also take the perspective of uh, victims of crime into consideration, and if so, how, how do you do it? <clears throat> I, I think that in Norway we do not pay enough attention to the victims of crime. Um, uh, being a governor, my job, uh, my mission is to confront the inmate about what he has done mm -hmm. and through talking with him, um, trying to give some examples how he uh, would experience himself if he was treated in a terrible way in that small community as the prison is. We try to have focus on the victims, victims of crime, but I think it is difficult for a prison administration uh, to administrate some kind of care for victims. Mm. It must be some other authorities who are doing that. Mm. I do believe in what I call restorative justice way of thinking, that they can be able to face, to meet their victims. Uh, and be, because here we are again about responsibility, we have taken the responsibility away from uh, these people. We just lock them up and throw the key away. And, and, and the people in the streets of uh, Oslo say, oh, well, he must be responsible, so put him to prison. That has nothing to do with responsibility, not even for what he has done to a, to a person and, uh, and, and his victims. We need to create a system where they can work with their values and, 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 and to understand that what they do to others, they do towards themselves. In that way, uh, I talked about the farming. We, we, we converted the farming on the land, so we don't use any fertilizers. Uh, and, uh, we be, and, 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 and we tried to teach the inmates who were working on this big farm that the way you treat the nature, the nature will treat you back. So instead of using fertilizers, in, uh, uh, to, instead of f uh, trying to, 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 to do that, we just see that what we, what we, the way we treat the farmland, we get a better result. Takes more time, but the fruits and the vegetables will be better. And the inmates, they learned about that. So I said, whatever you do to your neighbor, you hurt yourself. So the whole system on the island is based on a holistic approach or a gestalt uh, approach. Um, and that's the secret behind this, this prison. It takes t years to establish this. And uh, it takes a couple of days to pull it down if you appoint the wrong people there. Mm. So frankly speaking, what you tried to establish in Bastoy is or to build a kind of community that is more human, that uh, allows forms of participation, 
that doesn't make such a big difference between staff and inmates, uh, and that is to some extent even democratic. Uh, I read in an article that there is democratically elected councils on uh, Bastoy Island uh, of staff members and inmates, and still a prison, uh, a panel institution is built on division. So you have panel institutions for women and for men. You have panel institutions for different generations. Could you imagine that this division one day in the future is kind of, that it's able to overcome such divisions even in panel institutions? Yes, so I can, I can see that, but it will take a lot of uh, it, resources and, and, and the, the right uh, size and quality of the stuff. Mm. Uh, I, uh, th let me just tell you a, a small story. Um, when I was resigning after uh, uh, all these years, I was walking around saying goodbye to the different sections of both staff and, and not at least the inmates. And in, in a group of inmates, about 30 people sitting in that big room, I was saying goodbye. And I felt I, I should be very honest, and I, I said that there have, been, there have been some nights where I have had problem with sleeping because of my job. But I'm happy to tell you that this has never had to do with you as inmates. It has to, had to do with staff, economy, that kind of things. Because the, the best or the worst resources I would have as a prison governor is the staff. Of course, we can talk about buildings and, 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 and you make it into a, an arena of normality or a small community, but it, you always end up with the lack of right education, the right, the, the, you, you, you should use much more resources to recruit the people into these kind of positions, uh, which is given so much power. By the way, you who are sitting here, how many of you have used uniform in your work? Some kind of uniform? Anyone? No, look at you. I said to Abby yesterday, I spent a lot of time to train the officers, the staff there, to become aware of what is happening in the moment you put on your uniform. Oh, I need my uniform. I love my uniform. Yes, I can see you do that. But are you aware of what is happening with you, your feelings, your personality? when you take on this uniform, and it's created distance between you. And so I didn't wear a uniform. That was a couple of times a year where I dressed up like a Father Christmas, uh, because I wouldn't like that distance. And being young out there, or being, and I, I had a, a man, we had an open day. Once a year, we had an open day. We invited the public in there, and the inmates were all involved in organizing games and guiding around the island. And suddenly, I saw an old person there, in my age, he had passed 70. And I recognized him, he was a previous uh, inmate. And he had three small children uh, around him. And I went to say hello, and I said, are you back? And he said, oh no, this is my grandchildren. And I said, have you brought your grandchildren in, in the back? And he said, I would, they have, I've told them so many stories about what was happened with me during my stay here, so I would like them to experience this place. My best experience was when inmates knocked on my door the day of the release and said, Arne, I, would, I have something to tell you. And I said, what, what, what's that? Something has happened with me. And I said, so what has happened with you? I've discovered myself. I've discovered that I can trust in myself. I've discovered that I am a human being. I've discovered uh, I, I, I'm, I'm okay. And I said, how come? And he said, the way uh, you have related to me, not, not only me, but the staff and the animals and what I've experienced since the island. I'm quite secure that he has quite a, a good chance of going back into the society without uh, doing any more harm to his neighborhood. 
And that, that's, that's, that must be the point, isn't it? Prison. The only thing it should be as a punishment, you, you lose your freedom. But the, the losing the freedom is not the worst. The inmates say, I, I, I told Abby her, uh, just before we started her, I had a man coming to me and I said, Anna, please, can I stay here? Don't release me. He had done a very serious crime. And I said, and I said, well, no, I can't do that. And I, he said, and I would like to be buried here when I die. Time is running so fast, so I would like to use the last five to ten minutes to open up to questions from you, from the audience, and I see already first question here. How does this work? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I, I have actually two quick questions. So the first is, um, do you have any data uh, to back up like that, um, the ones who uh, serve their term in your prison um, do not go back to crime as versus to the normal prisons? And then the second question is, why aren't we seeing if indeed this model is successful? And obviously, uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking, wow, that's fascinating. But why is this not being um, implemented across uh, different countries? To your first question, um, as I said, well, the evaluations about reoffending show that 16% uh, of the people who did their prison sentence on that uh, prison, on that island, uh, committed new crime after uh, in a period of two years but the average in Norway is 25 30 and in Europe at such 75 that's the only answer I can give you to the other question of you that is a tricky one I very often get that answer and I said well I am not the one who can answer it but the only way I can say it you talked about Europe. I can talk about Norway because it's only one place in Norway like this. Why? How come? We do know, the politicians know that this works, they have seen it. But why they don't do a set up more prisons like this? I don't know. I don't, I don't think we really like this situation. Uh, I think they feel that the society's need for revenge and being tough on crime is my, maybe a reason. I don't know. Uh, it's even the cheapest way to run a prison because it basically are self-sufficient. So I, 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 I'm struggling with this myself. I do know the answer. I, I do know that what works, but we don't seem to, to do anything with it. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. It's 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 uh, it's something which I'm struggling with all all the time, in my mind. We still have time for two more questions. So. Yeah, it also has a little bit to do with with this. Um, like, so the way we have constructed the majority of prisons and the punishment system and the idea that a person commits a crime and then goes to prisons and is punished reflects the way we deal with, we, the view of society in how to dealing with problems in general. And so I was wondering if you think of lack of trust, uh, Anne, is, is a general problem in society overall? And if so, how do you see that? Um, maybe we can ask both of you. Uh, I would be also interested in your response. I think it comes down to every individual has to make a decision about how they go forward. You know, and from that grows a different way. You know, we, we lost a lot of our system at the time of the invasion and now we're recreating it. You know, our practices are different than they were before, but our values aren't. And so it's really about going, okay, what is my value and how am I going to live? And at what point am I going to say in these various 
situations in my life, I'm going back to this value system and I'm going to stick to that. And so that's what it amounts to is teaching people to do that and giving them the knowledge of the facts, you know, the fact that people didn't know the percentages that he said is alarming. You know, those kinds of things you have to get a grasp on and then you have to say, I'm going to go forward with that. And we haven't been taught to do that, you know, in the larger society that's power or rights-based because it's, it's not to their advantage and it doesn't support their method of power, um, their message of right, their messages of greed. It just isn't the same thing. So we have to, as individuals, make different decisions. And uh, I would just like to, to remind uh, us about that. I think it is a short-term thinking. Uh, when a crime takes place and the person is taken to court and the sentences is given and you go to prison, we think, well, uh, that's the place you belong and we are safe. But as I said, uh, we should think about a, a bit longer because in Norway and most European countries, people will be returning one day. So we should use that time where we take people away from the society into imprisonment. We should spend that time in investing in that person to make sure that the risk of his behavior will be reduced the day when he is released. And the other reason why it is like this, I think we are quite primitive as, as human beings uh, and, and we, 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 uh, we, we need years and years to discover how things should be and we are a bit slow in it. But we are on the right way, I hope. Thank you so much. So we have time for one last uh, question here. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I have so many questions and many pictures in my head because I had the chance to visit a women's correction center in Washington. So all the person I met, I, they came back in my head thanks to Abby's <laughs> contribution. Um, but I was wondering, we are talking about giving people a second chance, but I want to step one step back. Um, and ask the question, isn't the problem uh, that people are criminalized and uh, put to prison? You mentioned the economic issue to this, Abby, before, that they work and it's a huge impact for some um, regions even, that people work there and not uh, being paid. So is it how big or where is the will that they get a chance or who's, in it, who's interested in it at at the very end, or is there the interest to have people just be criminalized and have some work, for example, um, for this reason, because I learned it's a huge issue. Am I correct, Abby? <laughs> so the question is about economics and what role it plays, or? I, I learned that um, in, in some cases, it's really a huge um, amount of money that people work or people work in the prisons mm -hmm. and they're not paid, okay. and it really has a huge impact for the whole region, for right. example. So it's not an interest to heal them or to give them uh, personal development, but rather to keep them imprisoned. Yes. I mean, I think that the answer to the question is, is that true? And it is true. And, but the rest of us have to take the responsibility at some point in our lives, if we get a choice, to say no to that, to say no, because it doesn't work and it's not right. And if it doesn't reflect our values, I mean, there's only so much every person can do in the course of a day. So you can't fight all of the devils. You have to say, you know, here's the devil in my world and I'll fight that. And if I get a chance, I'll fight this other one, you know, and I think that's a reasonable thing. I mean, I was walking my dog by the river and I looked down this winter and because we had not been allowed to do cultural burns, there was a horrible forest fire and then the rains came and then the mountains slid into the river and then 
it killed the fish. You know, and I looked down and I saw a dead fish and I started to cry. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because my duty as a human was to do the cultural burns and I didn't do it. But I also know I can't do everything. But I know that the things that come before me that I can help with. So I will help negotiate our right to do cultural burns. Because we were stopped from doing cultural burns and now everybody's suffering. So I will do a little part of that because I'm, that's my responsibility. But I also know I can't do it all. You know, and sometimes all you can do is cry. Um, you know, and go, I will try when I have a chance in my life, when that little opening comes to negotiate, to do that. That's what I can contribute to this situation. So you have to figure out what you can do in each of those places. You know, and it, it does, unfortunately, the people who came are very interested in money. It's a big deal to them. I don't quite understand it, but they, they get all wrapped around it. More money than they can possibly spend, they just keep wanting more of it. You know, it's their sickness. Um, and so we have to just work to make sure we don't acquire the sickness. Thank you so much, Abby. I think uh, both of your examples, both of your um, uh, engagements, uh, activities, shows uh, are, are really very inspiring examples of how we could make uh, the world, our society, a better place. I had a very last question. I had prepared it uh, for, for the end of our discussion, but somehow it becomes rhetoric because I wanted to ask you what do you think majority or uh, like our society can learn from your examples uh, in Bastoy Island uh, prison and uh, the Yurok um, community? I think you answered it already. Um, and also the answer to the question that is formulated in our panel, not worthy of our trust, we kind of also answered positively through uh, our panel and discussion. And um, I would also claim that we need to reformulate the subtitle and not to talk about criminals, but as you proposed, relatives or humans. Mm -hmm. And talking about you, uh, you had uh, one more comment to it or? Uh, to that, yes, I, I, got into <laughs> I got into a terrible discussion with the uh, chief, um, uh, uh, chief uh, um, I lost the name in 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 uh, I spent a year in Georgia uh, the chief chief prosecutor mm -hmm. in the public with the television uh, <clears throat> and he started to talk about that Georgia was full of criminals with a criminal mind. And I said, I'm, I'm a psychotherapist. I, I get very curious. Is that a, a, a Georgian disease or diagnosis? <laughs> and he was very upset, of course. And I said, because I, I, don't, I, I haven't found that gene yet. Um, so I don't know what criminals actually are. Um, so I have never met them. I've, never, I've met people who have do, done a lot of criminal uh, actions. Uh, I did one last night when I crossed the street here on the red light. I was not caught, and uh, no, but so so Lucky. we should we should get rid of that, yeah, and and the reason for crime is in the society, not in the prison, and not not first of all in the mind of people, but in the society, and uh, the, what is the alternative uh, to? I just hope that uh, I have seen things happen in Romania and other places where I worked. Uh, not enough, but what is the alternative? Is that to just shut up and give up? Hmm. Thank you so much both for coming to the Kultur Symposium in Weimar, for sharing your stories and experiences with us. And now at the very end, I'm very pleased to announce the next event, which is kind of closely linked to the topic that we were discussing, because we do not need only to repair the relationships between humans and humans, but also between humans and animals, 
cross species relationships, and that's what the next panel is about. And I would ask my colleague.